open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 17. We'll begin reading in verse 20, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Again, the Gospel of Luke chapter 17, and we'll begin reading in just a moment in verse uh, 20. We would all agree that there are many important questions that everyone must ask and answer. Uh, one of the questions goes something like this. How does it all end? Of course, this question is intrinsically related to other pertinent questions such as, where did I come from? Where am I going after I die? And why am I here? In other words, questions related to our origin, the purpose and meaning of life, and our ultimate destiny. The answers and the presuppositions that inform the answers to these questions are the constituent parts of a biblical worldview. In other words, seeing the lens, or seeing the world through the lens of Scripture, which is the way that we should view all things. So going back to the first question, how does it all end? Now, there's a couple of ways that we can address this. We can speak of or answer the question in terms of the cosmic or the corporate uh, end of all things. Or we can speak of it in terms of how will my life come to an end. In other words, uh, we can ask it personally. And I want to deal with that question first. I'll deal with it very, very briefly because our text is going to deal with the question of how uh, do, do all things come to their appropriate end in terms of the cosmic or cor uh, corporate realities. Apart from the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we'll talk about this morning, your life, my life, the life of everyone who has ever lived, will end in death. Upon that death, you will step into eternity and you will either have been prepared through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to enter into His presence, to enjoy Him forever, or you will be condemned to an eternity apart from Him in a place called hell. That is that God has given you this life to hear and respond positively to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is how we prepare for that. what in some sense is uncertain. I cannot tell you the hows or the whens or the wheres of your death, but I can tell you with 100% certainty, you will die and you must be prepared. And there is one way to be prepared, and that is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to the second aspect of the question, the corporate, the, co the uh, cosmic aspect, how does it all end? The Bible speaks often to this issue, and here's your big theological word for the day, eschatology, the doctrine of last things. And unfortunately, there's not a single place in the Bible that gives an exhaustive, uh, chronological, and systematic explanation of exactly how the final epoch of human history will be closed and how the eternal state will be ushered in. To be sure, we know a lot, but we don't know it all. Maybe I should rephrase that a little bit. We know it all, in some sense, we don't know how it all fits together. It seems to me to be a bit like these jigsaw puzzles that my grandchildren love to put together. Uh, we, we've got all the pieces in the box, but people put them together differently. And so there's going to be one ultimate and final way that the puzzle, all of the events that are related to the final things upon earth, will ultimately come together and, again, create and complete this perfect picture. Now, Luke is going to give us 
an edited version in chapter 21 of what we call the Olivet Discourse. That's Jesus' most extensive teaching, instruction, information that we have from him um, related to the end of all things. Uh, he ties it uh, to the, the soon, from his perspective, coming of the destruction of Jerusalem and the demise of the temple. The more expansive version is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter uh, 20, or the Gospel of Matthew chapter uh, 24. This account that we're at today in, in Luke 17 gets at these issues a little bit differently in that Jesus is going to answer the question of the Pharisees regarding the arrival of of the kingdom of God. Jesus gives to them, to the Pharisees, a, a partial and what might seem to be an enigmatic answer, uh, but it also prompts him to give a more, more expansive instruction uh, to the disciples related to this business of the kingdom of God. So let me be sure you understand, uh, the return of Christ, the end of all things, the kingdom of God, those are all interrelated subjects. If you're going to speak of one of them by necessity, you will tend to speak to all of those issues and to others. So my question, how does it all end? Uh, their question, uh, when will the kingdom of God come? The question in the text. If the it means the end of the current world order, that is, all that has persisted in its rebellion against God, it ends with the cataclysmic and utter destruction of the world system. The eternal state is ushered in with a final and full realization of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is not only coming, but was there present in Jesus' day and is still present in our day. The kingdom of God is present as I speak to you today. And I want, if you don't remember anything else from today, remember this. You must see the kingdom in its present form to have any hope of seeing that glorious kingdom in its final form. You must see and experience and understand the present realities of the kingdom to have any hope of enjoyment of the future perfected, and consummate kingdom. So, let's read here beginning in verse 20 of Luke 17. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, look here, or do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, they, will eat, be, there were, they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot. They were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, that night there will be two in one, in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures 
will gather. Pray with me. Father, once again, we thank you for your truth. Uh, Lord, it is your word to us. It is given to your people who have always lived in a troubled world. We indeed are presently citizens of your kingdom, if indeed we have been born again, so that we may see that kingdom, so we may submit to its king, so we may understand and obey its message. But while we live in that kingdom, we also live in a fallen world in which evil is very real. And we will live in a day in which uh, oppression and the abuse of military might and all other types of might are pervasive. And Lord, it does cause us to uh, wonder at times what is going on. But we know this. You are working your will and your way. That you do all things well. That nothing is too difficult for you and that you work all things according to your own purpose. I pray that the reality that your kingdom has come and it will come will be a comfort to us for this day and for the days ahead. I pray that indeed that we would all be prepared for the day that is sure to come. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Very thankful uh, for Josh's sermon last week. I was able to uh, listen uh, to it. A wonderful uh, exposition of this text concerning the, the healing of the, of the ten lepers. And he gave me a, a bit of a, a, a free advertisement. And, and indeed, uh, uh, I, I am excited about the text today. I have been excited as uh, I realized it was uh, uh, coming up. And... Um, I grew up in the early 70s, those days when Hal Lindsey came to prominence. If you don't know that name, you can Google it later. But uh, at any rate, uh, kind of an apocalyptic fever in uh, the church. Most every Sunday there was these dire warnings about things that were uh, suddenly and surely uh, at, to be at hand. And it seems to me that the greater our awareness of the troubles of our world become, the more pointed and precise becomes our interest related to these things pertaining to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take a Russian madman invading another country for us to realize the fallenness of the world. Uh, whether we look at the last two years, the last ten years, the last century, we should know that it is a troubled world. It is a world collapsing upon itself. And our hope, just like the hope of all that have come before us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope is the King and the reality of His kingdom. And so let us live with that hope. Now, and Josh mentioned a couple of interesting things. And as you look at the text, as you look at verse 19 and then over to verse 20, I'm not sure exactly how much time elapsed, uh, whether it was a, uh, just the, this discussion was immediately adjacent to the healing or whether some hours or even days had passed. But I believe this, that Luke wants to put these things together so that we are certain to understand that Jesus had demonstrated the power of the king and kingdom. That there was no real reason for anybody to mistake who Jesus Christ was. And so I think they're, they're together for a reason. He had given ample evidence as recorded all through Luke and the balance of the other Gospels. Uh, he had healed uh, the, the sick, he had cast out demons, he had, he had uh, healed those that were uh, incapacitated, he had even calmed the storm, fed the 5,000. All of these things are indicative of the identity of this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we come to the, the text here today, be reminded, Jesus is steadfastly pursuing his objective. His objective, his death on the cross at Calvary 
for our salvation, for the atonement of our sins. And so while traveling to Jerusalem, he is dealing with the obstinance and the obtuseness of the disciples, as well as the increased opposition of the religious community headquartered in Jerusalem. So let's look beginning in verse 20 with this question uh, asked by the Pharisees regarding the when of the kingdom of God. Now, you're probably not surprised. The bulk of our time really is going to be spent on verses 20 and 21, and we're going to kind of fly through the other 15 verses because they really kind of fall nicely in, fl in place. If we get what's going on in the first two verses, then the rest of it will kind of fall in place and we can just kind of work through it in outline form. And so it seems, and, and some commentators will, will note this, that in Jesus' day, whether formally or informally, there were those of the religious community, uh, Pharisees and maybe even some Sadducees, uh, that would go out into the countryside if they heard that there was one that might possibly be the Messiah. They were kind of the, the messianic uh, search committee. And, and they would go out, and certainly there were probably those that were not formally a part of the process. They would just go out and, and try to, to, to meet those that they had heard were out there. And so we see it both in the case of John the Baptist. They ask you, are you the one? And he says, no, I'm not the one. And, and so uh, we see here once again these Pharisees wanting to examine. They want to quiz the, the Lord Jesus Christ upon the... Uh, healing of the man paralyzed that was dropped down uh, through the roof. And Jesus uh, announces that his sins are forgiven. And they begin to question, who can forgive sins but God and God alone? And, and then they question him about why he doesn't fast. And they question him why the, the disciples are permitted to gather some grain for their own need on the Sabbath day. And they question him about his interaction with a sinful woman. And they question him about why you're not washing your hands as, as John's disciples. And, and so they're watching Jesus very carefully. And so they want to quiz him now about the nature of the kingdom, when it is that this kingdom is going to appear. So before we deal with the when, we might need to talk about the what. What is this kingdom that Jesus is being asked about? Now, I want to be sure you understand this. There, there's at least some sense, in a very real sense, that the entirety of the created order is the kingdom of God. It's His. It belongs to Him by right of creation and by right of His sovereign rule over all things. As we like to say, there is not a rogue molecule anywhere. It is all under. It exists because of God, and it continues to exist because of God. It continues to operate according to its properties by the power of Almighty God. So, the Bible notes this reality. David proclaimed in 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13, For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. Or as David would write in Psalm 24, The, the earth is is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God is fully sovereign over all, or as we have sung, this is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought. What a great confession. What a, what a great, great, as I look at, 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 absolutely insane dictators across the world. As I look at the insanity of our culture, I rest in the thought of God's sovereign watch care. With peculiar and particular reference to those that are a part of this particular kingdom that we're speaking to today, yes, indeed, all is the kingdom of God, but there's also a particular way in which there is a kingdom comprised of the redeemed. 
whether it's the old covenant saints of Israel or the new covenant saints of the church, this kingdom is a past, present, and future kingdom comprised of those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved. They are God's people living presently and conscientiously under his rule and reign, whether on heaven or whether in heaven or upon earth. In the past, the kingdom was encapsulated or embedded in the Old Testament theocracy of Israel. To be sure, not all of Israel was the true Israel. Much like the, the kernel of a seed is embedded within a husk. And so, Old Testament theocratic Israel was the husk that provided for the, the, the vital seed within of the true, uh, re believing, regenerate Israel. Israel was a visible earthly monarchy, and within it there was an invisible, spiritual, true or regenerate, believing Israel. In the present, the true church, or those saved by grace through faith, are the present reality of the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. And there will be a day in which the, the fullness of that kingdom will be realized with the perfected and, and glorified saints of the old and new covenants gathered, gathered around the throne of God, celebrating their singular Lord and Savior, the, their King, Jesus Christ, who saved them all, whether during the old covenant or during the new covenant by the shedding of his blood on the cross. If you're interested in this, one of the beautiful realities of New Covenant worship, if you go back and kind of go through Hebrews 10, 11, and 12, you get the emphasis of the gathered body in chapter 10, and then you get this reference to this great cloud of witnesses, the faithful that have gone before us in chapter 11, and this idea of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, okay, in, in chapter 12. And, and sometimes theologians call the, the reality of the experience of the people of God as the communion of saints. As we are gathered here today, we're in the presence of a great cloud of witnesses of those who are now in the kingdom in their glorified state they are the church victorious okay we are the church militant we are here on earth to continue the expansion and the fight of the kingdom but as we're gathered here today and even as we disperse but particularly with reference to our gathering here today we're in the presence of all of those who are of the kingdom of God who have been saved by God's grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Those are the kingdom citizens. And so we live knowingly and willingly under the authority of our King, whose name is Jesus Christ. There is a future in when that ki which that kingdom will be perfected or consummated, but as you look around you today, when you look at those sitting in this room with you, those that have been born again are the citizens of the present reality of the kingdom of God. We are the expression of the kingdom's reality, and get this, the manifestation of its power in the world. Because let me tell you something, for you to be saved, it took a mighty act of God. Not just in raising Jesus from the dead, but in raising your dead soul. Okay, so now, what were their expectations about a kingdom? This is kind of a synthesis of, of what the prevailing thought was, that a descendant of David would appear in a time of trouble in Israel in the world, that he would be announced... Uh, by a prophet uh, like Elijah, this, this descendant of David would unite and empower Israel. Jerusalem would be restored uh, to its glory, and the Jews would be gathered from their dispersal. 
This would be amidst the hostility of the Gentile world, but yet this Messiah, this Davidic king, would triumph in both a military and a political sense, and he would establish a rule that would last all the way into eternity. Now, all of those things have, have biblical warrant. Most of you probably, if you're not, shame on you, most of you are probably familiar with the scene in the book of Daniel chapter 2 where Nebuchadnezzar is troubled by a dream in which he sees this colossal statue, uh, a statue of a man that has a head of gold, a, a chest of silver, a, a, a middle part, a thigh, middle and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And so Nebuchadnezzar wants to know, well, what does this mean? It's very disturbing. And so young Daniel begins to explain to him exactly what is being revealed to him in terms of this dream. And he identifies that there is a stone cut without hands that destroys these kingdoms that are characterized by the iron and the clay, that in the days of the kings or kingdoms of iron and clay, this great stone, this great mountain shall come and he shall crush these worldly kingdoms that are in opposition to the stone or the mountain. And so in those days of the clay and iron kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So it's not unreasonable for them to think what I just outlined that they thought. But what they did not see for the most part was that the son of David was the one whose heel would be bruised by the serpent. And in his bruising, he would deliver the death blow to the head of the serpent. They failed to understand that the Messiah was the one who cried out as forsaken in Psalm 22 and describes his condition as, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up as a putchard. My tongue sticks to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. They have pierced my hands and feet. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. Now, we don't need to get all smug because we know exactly who that psalm is talking about, okay? We have the advantage of looking back over the course of history. But it is legitimate to ask ourselves the question, how could they have missed it? They missed that the promised one is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, and they didn't understand that the one Daniel described in chapter 9, verse 26, as the anointed one who would be cut off and have nothing. In short, they failed to see that the kingdom would be inaugurated by the arrival of the king, and that king would die for the sake of his kingdom, that having accomplished his kingdom's redemption, he would ascend to rule and reign at the right hand of the Father until all of his enemies would be made a footstool, the Jews of Jesus' day, and even to this day, didn't see the lapse of time between the first and the second coming that would be the time that the kingdom would expand to include those from every tribe and tongue who would be a kingdom of priests who would rule and reign forever in the joy of their Savior and their King. So, that's the what. Now, the when. Jesus replies to them, and we're still there in verse 20. We're not, we're not a, making a real, real big headway right now. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. His meaning, the present reality of the kingdom can't be seen or understood by natural, that is, unregenerate men. They don't recognize the king. They don't understand his message. They reject his authority, and they oppose his mission. So Jesus is saying this, this kingdom is, is coming. It's, 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 it's going to be among you, but because of your spiritual state, you're not going to get it. You're not going to 
see it. The kingdom doesn't arrive amidst these, this cosmic upheaval, even though occasionally you see that in the Old Testament prophets. And I'm going to give you a Hebrew lesson for the day. Okay? There's a phrase in Genesis 1. In Hebrew, it's tohu wabohu. Tohu wabohu. Say that with me. Tohu wabohu. Use it on your friends. It means formless and void. You can apply it as you choose. Jeremiah chapter 4, 23 describes the situation that would precede the deportation to Babylon as a time of tohu wabohu, that there is going to be cosmic chaos in the world, that the world is going to be disrupted. And so it was right to think that in some sense there would be a cosmic upheaval related to the appearing of the kingdom. But Jesus says to them, not for this appearing of the king at this time. And so this lapse of time between the inauguration, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in which he comes, and he, he'll tell us here in a minute that before all these things are going to happen, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. I'm going to accomplish the redemption of my kingdom. But in the interval between the first and the second appearing of the king, the kingdom is going to grow. The citizenship of the kingdom is going to expand, not, not by military means, not by political means, but by the proclamation of Jesus Christ and crucified. The world will judge that message as foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God that brings life and light out of death and darkness. The kingdom began and continues slowly, and it's surely in some sense secretly. Jesus illustrated this in Luke 13, 18. He talks about the kingdom and compares it to a mustard seed that's the smallest of the seeds of the garden, but when it grows, it becomes the largest of the plants of the garden. He compared it to leaven in a, a, a loaf of bread, that it begins as something small in comparison to the entirety of the loaf, but it comes to permeate the entirety of the loaf. That is, the kingdom begins as that which is small and inconsequential, but it ends up dominating the world. It, it ends up as the kingdom of the world. Now, so Jesus is saying to them, even if I, if I pointed it out to you, you won't see it. That's why we, we emphasize so often the words of Jesus in John 3. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, while certainly it means unless you're born again, you won't go to heaven, I believe the implications are, again, you do not see the present reality that the kingdom is alive and well in a fallen world apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that gives you the eyes to see and the ears to hear the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so, we can define the kingdom, we can illustrate it, we can demonstrate the kingdom, but the kingdom cannot be savingly comprehended apart from this thing we call the new birth. Apart from the new birth, you will find a way to dismiss it, to trivialize it, to nominalize it, to do, to do something to put it out of sight, out of mind. And so Jesus explained to them in casting out the demon as recorded in Luke eleven twenty, if I do this, it is a demonstration that the kingdom is here and the power of God is being demonstrated among you. When John the Baptist asked him, now, he was, John's in prison. It didn't turn out exactly like he thought it should have turned out. The king is here. The kingdom is coming. I'm a part of that, that king and, and kingdom, and here I am in prison. And Jesus sent back to you, to him, tell him of the signs that demonstrate who I am, that I am the one that he thinks that I am. I am the one that he identified and that he, appoint, he pointed to. And so Jesus could say to these Pharisees, you understand how to look at the weather and plan for that, 
but you cannot see what is clearly being demonstrated among you by my power and my proclamation that the king and his kingdom is here. And so there was ample evidence, and you're responsible for rightly interpreting the evidence, but until you have the eyes to see it and the ears to hear it, you simply will not get it. Now, let's move. We are making, making our way now. Verse 21, the second statement. Now, here's the interesting thing. Okay, the kingdom is not coming in ways that can be observed, okay? And they will say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, the Greek there, in the midst of you, is garhe basile to theu entos human estin. I knew you'd like that, okay? Now, there's a legitimate disagreement among those who translate. Remember, I've said this. Every translation is a commentary at the end of the day, okay? All right? Every, every translation is the beginning of a, comment, a commentary. There's two popular ways of translating the phrase, and both of them can be defended both grammatically and biblically. Was Jesus saying to the Pharisees, now remember my translation, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. That's an English standard version, okay? Some of you will have a translation that reads, the kingdom of God is inside of you or within you, okay? So, for the kingdom of God is within you. The Greek, the word entos. Jesus is referring to the inward spiritual reality of the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, reality of the lordship of Jesus Christ in the life of kingdom citizens. However, the you is referring to the Pharisees, who are the last people on earth to be characterized as those to whom the kingdom of God is dwelling within. Now, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within the believer. That's not, we're not denying that. I just don't think that's what Jesus is saying there. Now, the you could be a broader you than just the Pharisees. He, he could be saying that. And the word entos, in its other use in the New Testament, refers to the inside of a cup. And so the kingdom of God is inside of you. Okay? And again, you can see, I think, there's a certain reality to the realities of the king and kingdom dwell inside the heart and the mind of the believer, okay? But I think, and I'm not, it's not a hill I'm going to die on, okay? Don't, don't get stones and crucify me or whatever, you know, stone me, whatever you want to do. I think Jesus is saying that the kingdom is among you, that it is a present reality among you. You Pharisees, you, you live and walk around Israel, and it's here, and you can see it. We are here and now in 2000, uh, or 2022 in Clay, Alabama. The kingdom of God is here. It's among us. It is all around us. The kingdom is present. And so the king and its citizens are among you and its power be, is being demonstrated daily. Through the work of regeneration, you enter into this kingdom by means of faith and you recognize your fellow citizens and you honor your Lord and you hear and obey his message. And so Jesus, in answer to their question, the when, well, it's not going to come like you expect it to come, but it is coming, and in fact, it is here. Now, let's, talk, let's look at what he says to the disciples. This prompts him to offer some fairly expansive instruction related to this business of the kingdom to the disciples. His first words, the days are coming. And that, that's a phrase you, you see in the Old Testament prophets. When you see that, that means that you're about to be indicted for what's going on or you're about to be warned about that which is about to happen from God because of what's going on. Okay? So Jesus is about to say something uh, particularly important. Okay? And he is saying, you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Loose translation, it's going to be difficult. Difficult days are coming, okay? This kingdom is going to be associated with difficulty 
in the world. It will be dangerous, and the believer will long for the appearance of the Lord Jesus. Here Jesus refers to himself with one of the, his favorite titles, the, the Son of Man. This again refers to a prophecy in Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, in which one identified as a Son of Man is given a kingdom by the Ancient of Days. And that kingdom is described as one that will not pass away and will not be destroyed. The Son of Man is described as one to whom is given dominion and authority and glory that people, languages, and nations should serve him. In that day, the day of the Son of Man, the disciples' faith and the faith of all of those who come after them will be vindicated and their tormentors will be defeated. The final phrase seems to indicate the difficult days will linger. That is, the believer will desire the direct intervention of the Lord, but that day of deliverance would not be coming immediately. There seems to be a season of distress before the consummation, the perfection, the return of the king. You will, you will long to see this glorious return of the Son of Man, but it will not be immediately or soon coming. Okay, so he says to disciples, this time is coming, and in that time that is coming, uh, verse 23 is the beginning of basically eight statements that's going to clarify some of this. And they will say to you, who, who is the they of the text? Seemingly false teachers, false prophets, false Christ that want to say things that are not true in terms of the return of the king and his kingdom. They're going to be saying, look there or look here, and Jesus says, don't pay attention to them, don't, don't listen, don't, don't fall in uh, with, with that crowd. In fact, he gives a corrective, in do not chase after them, do not listen to them, and here's how you can distinguish between that which is true and that which is false. He gives an analogy in verse 24. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will be the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, there will be no need of somebody saying, now listen, Jesus is out in the desert. Jesus is over in the mountains. Jesus is down at the ocean. No, when, when the lightning cracks on the horizon, you can see it. You know the lightning has cracked, and you know that it is terrible, and it is dangerous, and it is foreboding. And so Jesus says, in the day that I'm returning to, uh, referring to, this day of the Son of Man, it will be as colossal, it will be as colossal as the lightning that cracks in the sky. And so Jesus offers the analogy that his return will be as visible as a powerful strike of lightning. It will be unmistakable. There will be no doubt as to the reality of his presence. It will be sudden and dramatic with an awesome display of his power. Seemingly, this is what's being described in Revelation 19.11 when he's described as returning on a white horse, being the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, destroying all of his enemies with the sharp sword of his mouth. And so, at his return, the dead will be raised, believers raptured, Again, the kingdom will be brought to earth. The kingdoms in opposition will be destroyed. But now look at verse 25. So all of that's going to take place. That's how we know he's going to return. Great, colossal, obvious, can't miss it. Verse 25. But first. The foundation upon which the kingdom is built is going to be accomplished. The purpose for my entering this realm at this time, at this place, is going to be accomplished. That, that I have entered this realm not to establish what you expect as an earthly kingdom that is military and political and economic in its orientation, but I have actually come as its king to rightly die for the subjects of the king. That I'm going to come and both Jew and Gentile are going to conspire to put me to death. And Jesus had been telling the disciples at least two occasions in the Gospel of Luke where he says, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be crucified. 
And so having said that, he moves forward into verses 26 and 27 with a second analogy. That the day of this colossal, dynamic, unmistakable, you can't miss it, appearing, is going to be just as it was in the days of Noah. That is, humanity will be going about their business. They will live without consideration of the reality of God and the approaching judgment. Now, notice verse 27. They're not necessarily doing anything terrible, at least as described there. They're eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage. They're going about their business. But they're going about their business with no consideration of the great reality of the king and his kingdom. Genesis 6-5 aptly describes the days of Noah. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on earth. Depravity, debauchery that is pervasive and rampant and radical. I suppose every Christian that's ever lived thinks that their day is the most radically depraved day that's ever existed on the face of the earth. I, I, I sense that now. But at any rate, days of great evil, days of great difficulty will coincide with this great, colossal, glorious appearing. Verse 28 through 30. The fourth thing he says, a third analogy. Not only will it be like the days of Noah, they're going to be like the days of Lot. In Sodom and Gomorrah, life was continuing. They were going about their business. There was no consideration of God, but judgment came upon them suddenly. So when Christ returns, the judgment is fixed, and it is certain. And in context with this discussion of, um, of what happens there, uh, or what happened in, in, in Sodom uh, and Gomorrah, is this idea that there are no second chances, no second opportunities. Destruction is coming upon them. It is soon, it is certain, and it is sudden. And so we see a warning there in verse 31. On that day, when you see this, when, when you see the judgment falling, on that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Again, when judgment comes, flee to safety. The judgment associated just prior to the return. I don't think you can flee the return. And for the believer, you don't want to flee the return. You want to flee to the return, not from the return. But to the believer, he seems to be saying, be wise. Be aware. When, when this judgment comes upon you, seek safety if it is available to you. And don't, don't be trifling with the stuff in the house. Don't be trifling with, with material possessions. Just get out. And see, he, then he offers this example of Lot's wife. God delivered them and said, get out. Go. Don't stop. Leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And seemingly in a, a longing type of way as to what was lost, Lot's wife turns. And we know her tragic end because she could not let go of that which she had in that previous life. So don't look back. Flee. And Jesus makes the point in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, the, the example you can't plow a straight row for the kingdom looking back at the past. And so, flee the judgment if it's all possible without regard for possessions or the trivialities of this life. And then, verse 33. Jesus has already, Luke has already recorded this statement once for us. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. That is, if you try to preserve your autonomy, your independence, if you refuse to submit to the Lordship of Christ, if you're not willing to lose yourself in being a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have lost your life. But if you surrender it to the Lordship of Christ, you will have gained your life and 
life eternal. And so he illustrates this. And again, this is another kind of point of contention and understanding what's being said. Look at verses 34 and 35. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. There's a bit of discussion. Is he referring to the judgment? Or is he referring to what we sometimes refer to as the, the rapture? Okay. Again, it's one of those things, I, I, I think he's probably speaking of the rapture. But the point, either way you understand it, one is taken in judgment and one left behind, or one received into glory by rapture and one left behind, the point is what? That people are being separated they're kingdom citizens, and they're the citizens of the kingdom of darkness. And in that moment of time, they shall be finally, ultimately, and eternally separated in a final act of judgment. So whatever it refers to there, the meaning is the same. There is a great separation that is coming. So that brings us to verse 37. Kind of an illustration the disciples, their heads are spinning, as is normal for the disciples sometimes. And they said to him, it's interesting, where? Where? Okay, Jesus just said, now, it's going to be like the lightning descending from heaven, so it doesn't seem to be a really pertinent, the where, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be abundantly clear where it is. And Jesus answers with some type of a, a proverbial type of answer. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Certainly the, the motif of the proverb is, is, is something of, 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 of doom and destruction. And it seems like Jesus is saying simply, it will be obvious. Just as if you were out and you saw vultures hovering in the sky, you can be sure that what's on the ground underneath where they're hovering is a dead body. Okay? And so that, 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 that you can deduce that. And so when you see these things, it is just as certain that vultures in the sky indicate there's a corpse. Jesus is saying it will be obvious to you when this day comes to pass. And so, how does it all end. When is this to take place? Well, Jesus answers the question, the kingdom has come. It was in the midst of them now. It's in the midst of us now. Before the ultimate and final and consummate return of the king, Jesus must suffer and die. He has. And he has ascended to glory where he now rules and reigns to await all of his enemies being made a footstool. It seems like the day of his return that we still anticipate will occur in the midst of colossal crisis, of great difficulty, of great upheaval, of great turmoil, in the presence of all types of apostasy, of all types of false teachers, of antichrist, of violence, of disease, and natural disaster. His return will certainly be unannounced, but we can anticipate it. Now here's the thing, it's, as we paint this picture of doom and destruction, we'll see this a bit next week. The kingdom will be alive and well. The kingdom will be robust. The kingdom will thrive until the day of his return. Do you see it? Are you a citizen of it? Are you ready to welcome your king on the day that he returns? Pray with me. Father, how we thank you for your word, for your truth, for the reality of your gospel. Lord, these are not, ultimately, they're really not secondary issues. They're things that sometimes we disagree about some of the details. But, it is a part of your good news that the king who died to establish a kingdom of redeemed citizens shall return one day 
and shall perfect that plan. That that, that, that plan shall reach its ultimate fulfillment uh, in that you will wipe away every tear and we will dwell with you forever and we shall know the joy of your glory forever and ever and ever. We thank you for a sure promise in a, in a world in which there's great, great uncertainty. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.